Hello and welcome to episode 7 of the Good Enough Mums Club podcast, where sometimes being good enough is best. Just before we get into this episode, we do swear in this podcast. So if you're listening with kids around and want to wait until later to catch up, we get it, don't worry. How will I ever be good enough? When will the loneliness fade and will it fade away? Why does it have to be so tough? Hard as I try, I'll never be good enough. My name is Emily Beecher and I'm Jade Samuels and we're the hosts of the Good Enough Moms Club podcast. Every week we'll initiate a mom into the club and explore the complexities and realities of modern motherhood. You can join the club and find out more about the musical or future episodes of the podcast by following us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, searching Good Enough Moms Club. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Please rate and review wherever you listen. So in this episode, we're chatting with influencer Yasmin Johal. You might already know her from being on the mother and baby mum list for 2020. Yasmin is a kick-ass mum. She found out she was pregnant when she was 21 and already five months into her pregnancy with their adorable little boy, Remy. We also talk about how she's starting to consider the possibility that Remy could be autistic and the emotions and learning that all that involves. We caught up with me in Birmingham... Emily in London and Yasmin in Nottingham all on Zoom. So let's just get into it. Hi Yasmin, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Uh, Whereabouts in the world are you right now, my love? Uh, I'm at home in Nottingham in our very makeshift study that we had to put together when lockdown started because (laughs) my boyfriend's working from home. So we had this like We've got this really tiny cupboard room in our house that we used to just use for laundry that we didn't want to put away. And we had to put all our laundry away in April, oh, no. which was the least favourite part of lockdown. And now it's just a room with a desk and a computer and randomly all of Danny's weights because he also uses this as a little gym as well. It smells, it smells great in here. It sounds like my idea of heaven. I'd love a room for a gym. It'd be amazing. <laughs> Not one this small. Yeah, (laughs) you could do one side of your body at a time. (laughs) We're going to kick off with a little round of Would You Rather. And we're looking for quick fire one word answers. I mean, no one's gave us quick fire one word answers up to yet. But who knows? We live in hope. Okay. Okay. So would you rather blue hair or purple hair? Blue. Step on Lego or step in P? Step on Lego. No. (laughs) I take that back. (laughs) <laughs> did you just physically feel it as you said the words of oh no one yeah, wants I was that. Like, I never want that no not ever parenting books or parenting podcasts podcasts slipknot or metallica slipknot that one was so fast <laughs> you were like, i know nothing else <laughs> okay biscuits or cakes cakes okay and what's the best vegan junk food oh this is really dirty but i just love a vegan kebab and I don't know why oh, wow. I never liked kebabs before I was vegan but okay. I think it's because it feels like the least vegan thing you can have like it's so, <laughs> it just shouldn't that you shouldn't be able to get vegan kebabs really um but I think because meat kebabs are so suspicious like is that even meat no one knows so yeah. I think it's really easy to replicate vegan versions um, yeah, I was gonna say I would much rather have a vegan kebab than any one, day. that weird <laughs> meat on a stick that's been there for eight hundred years. Yeah, just grey and congealing. Yeah, any day. Sure. Okay, Thomas the Tank Engine or Lightning McQueen. Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> <laughs> day festival or camping festival? Camping. But by camping I mean a hotel. <laughs> Oh, the girl after our own Hello, hearts. Welcome to the club, babe. You're in already. <laughs> oh, we go to the campsite, do it all, put, make this fires, do the marshmallows, and then get in your car and get in a bed. That is so me. I do love a bit of camping, but I mean, I'm proper like blow up mattress, yeah. feather duvet, your pillows, you know, like... I can camp, but I am not hauling some ass tent on my back into yeah. sort of a hovel in the rain. That is not my thing. It's interesting how fast that changed for me, though, because I was literally like 
I was the kind of person that would camp with just a sleeping bag on and that was it like nothing beneath me or on top of me like that was it and then within the year that I had Remy after that I was just like don't ever put me in a tent ever again I don't know what <laughs> happened but yeah I tell. I think it's you like you've you've been put through so much your body, when you, <laughs> your body goes I'm sorry love I can't do that thing that you used to like anymore because I'm tortured and traumatized <laughs> yeah yeah, pretty much. Okay, YouTube or Instagram? Oh, Instagram, I think. Um, and what is the first word you think of when you think of the word mum? Um, oh, for some reason, wholesome, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> That's I feel like, oh, yeah, I don't know why. I think, um, yeah, I think it is wholesome. Like, despite, I think that's the one, well, I can't speak for every mum, but I feel like that's the one consistency across like all mums is you're like my life's a lot more wholesome now or at least it's that case for me oh that's, lovely. that's really lovely okay um we're gonna go into the main questions now then Yasmin what was your journey to becoming a mum like um <laughs> I don't want to go into the whole story just for the sake of the people listening who might come from my audience who have probably heard this story like so many times but the condensed version um the full version's on my youtube if you if you do want to know plug 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 um (laughs) version is that I found out I was pregnant um just after mine and Danny's six month anniversary you celebrate those kind of milestones in your first relationship so we just uh celebrated six months and then three days later I found out I was 24 weeks pregnant oh my god um so you've been pregnant for the whole of your relationship. Yeah, so I think I must have gotten pregnant, like, probably, like, the week we met. Like, you know what it's like at the beginning of a relationship. Yeah. Though, so <laughs> yeah. It's not that surprising. Um, yeah, so luckily we were, like, super in love. We were already looking to, like, move in together and all of that kind of stuff. So it wasn't as scary as it sounds. I mean, it was really scary. I'm not going to lie. I was 21 when I found out and I was at uni. So those kind of aspects of it were scary, but like having a baby with Danny wasn't scary, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, And yeah, so it was all, it was quite, I mean, it was obviously very unplanned. And so there wasn't like that. I don't know. I feel like, I know it's different for everyone, but I feel like a lot of people kind of sit down and they say like, I think we're ready. Like, I think this is the next step. I think this makes sense in our timeline right now, but that made absolutely no sense for our timeline because we were still in that like getting not getting to know each other but like we hadn't had our first holiday we hadn't done a lot of that kind of coupley stuff together yet um we hadn't had like our first apartment and things like that so it didn't really make sense at the time um but we didn't have much choice which <laughs> I now realize it's like at the time I was like this is horrible I'm being like forced to push a baby out of me but um I now realize I kind of take the perspective of like everything happens for a reason and I Completely. genuinely feel like Remy was meant to like that was meant to happen when it did because how else did he hide for five and a half months <laughs> like and when he was born he was 10 pounds like he was not a small baby <gasps> Oh I don't know where he where was he hiding? Where was he? We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. We've talked about this before, Emily. That mm. your the babies that you have are the babies that are meant to be, and yeah. that is so it's so strange. But yeah, I think people. one of the most shocking things for me, and it's so such an example of so many things that are wrong with the medic, medical industry, is how many doctors just fobbed you off. Like yeah. how many doctors were just like looking for an excuse to get you out of the room, didn't really believe you, yeah. didn't, didn't take what you were saying seriously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I spoke about that in another podcast recently um, where I was talking about, like, young mum representation. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time I didn't realise this, but I think I've sort of, since then, I feel like it probably is because I was young. And even though medical professionals shouldn't have, like, a bias obviously um I was about to say they have one job they don't they have many jobs but um (laughs) one like part a big part of their job should be they don't have any kind of bias towards any type of people but I do feel like the fact I was young and I would uh, like go in to see the doctors by myself so I just looked 
I think, I don't know, I, I think they sort of had a certain perception of me um, and I was like irresponsible and things like that. And so I feel like they kind of shrugged me off a bit more, whereas maybe if I was older, they might have listened. Um, but there's that argument, but there's also the argument of um, women of colour and the way yeah. that they're treated within the medical profession full stop. They're just not yeah. taken seriously. That like the statistics, I don't know what it is for um, Asian women, but I know for black women, one in five, like you're five times more likely to die during childbirth yeah. as a black woman than any other race. So that really speaks volumes as to what they think of women from a certain demographic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think having that crossover of being like, I mean, I talk about this a lot, but, you know, having sort of multiple, I guess, like marginalised identities, like being mm. young. Uh, I wouldn't have seen being young as being a marginalised identity before, but I think being a young mum is. So being young, being working class and being a woman of colour, it's kind of, it's like the holy trinity of like not being listened to um yeah. but yeah at the time it was really really frustrating like I remember when I found out I was pregnant my mum was like really angry with the original doctor surgery that had like not listened to me yeah. um but I kind of just got to the point where I was just like I made my peace with it because especially now like definitely now as soon as I realized I was happy to have the baby and I was excited and things like that I was like really they probably did me a favor even though they didn't mean to, um, it was probably ideal that like I got so far along into the pregnancy because it would have been a lot scarier to find out early on because I would have only been with Danny for like whatever the length of the pregnancy was. So if mm. I found out I was two months pregnant, we would have only been together for two months and really you don't think, okay, yeah. let's have a baby two months in. But I think it was just at a point where we were very much like, this is it, like we're properly together like we're going to get married um like we discussed getting married the week before and then this happened so it's kind mm. of like just all the timings wow were like, I don't know if you believe in that kind of stuff no I do I believe yeah, in no. serendipity 100% yeah. we all do yeah. <laughs> so what happened after you found out you were pregnant like you know you're at uni your friends are all young you're doing the uni thing you're doing the you know being young going out thing like yeah. what happened with friends and family and um sort of like well various things so like my uni friends were vaguely supportive like they tried to be but we were all just so young and irresponsible at the time and I think the sort of novelty when they first found out wore off when they realized that like a baby isn't just like a like getting a dog yeah. and that my whole life would change and then yeah, I just don't think they were really up for that, which is fine. Like, I've not really held it against them because they weren't, like, my best friends ever. They were just my uni friends. And we had a very specific, like, social circle. Like, we would only really hang out if we were going out drinking. So yeah, <laughs> when I found out I was pregnant, I was like, I don't think I want to see these people sober. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it all kind of worked out for the best like they all came to see Remy once when he was born and then I never saw them again it was just like a fade out kind of situation but a lot of my friends who so a lot of my friends just live in different cities like I've met a lot of them through um like YouTube events and things like that um so they were all really supportive it's just that they didn't live close by so they'd come and visit every few months but obviously it's not that like constant support um so yeah that was like with friendship and then with uni I just kind of went in it's so weird because when you find out something so big as like that you're having a baby it's so huge to you that you kind of forget that you have to do all this like boring admin type admin as well. <laughs> yeah and that like yeah there's like things to sort out so I had to go into uni and I was just kind of like what is the process and they gave me a few options and the one that I chose so this was the start of my third year of uni so I basically finished my first semester um and then left uni when I was like eight months pregnant and then I went back the following September I think just to finish bits off and then do my dissertation and stuff so I went back to uni when he was like eight months old um which in itself was really hard like dropping him off at nursery when he's that small I was just like this was never my plan because if I'd had a job when I felt felt pregnant I would have probably had a longer maternity leave like mm. I probably would have got done the year um but yeah it was just going back when he was so small was like quite sad but it was like that's definitely one of my favorite well best what's the word like proudest achievements 
is doing uni with a baby because uni's hard it was hard yeah. before I had a baby <laughs> I just finished my master's with my daughter in tow and it is bloody hard work isn't yeah. it because your brain doesn't work the same way either yeah, definitely I was at drama school training to be an actor as well when I got pregnant so I had to drop out and go back with my daughter to London when she was one so yeah. I get it completely it's really like mm-hmm. You just don't, you, your brain isn't fired on as well 100% no. when you first have a baby. I don't even think when you first have, I mean, still, like you're just having to juggle so many life things constantly, right? Like that's the thing. It's like all the life admin stuff that a baby or a child brings to it. And you're yeah. all constantly, you have to get them somewhere before you can get somewhere. And mm. you actually do need some peace and quiet so you can read and study and stuff like that. So yeah amazingly well done to yeah, you well not done. everyone can do yeah. it. it's tough um how are your act like your friends not uni friends like your actual home home friends about having the baby um everyone was quite good I think it was just it's it was just really unexpected for everyone I think and so yeah they just didn't expect I was just a very different person then to what I'm like now um so even like my family were really shocked um like some people in my family were like had really negative reactions like they they didn't think it was like right for me to have a baby um when I was that young and not married and things like that but even my close family like my sisters are like my best friends and we're really really close but they were just I think quite worried about me Mm. um because I'm the youngest sister and I've always like taken that and ran with it like I'm such a baby or I was before (laughs) when when I met Danny because he's a little bit older than me so he was like the sort of responsible one in the relationship and he was and because of that I didn't take responsibility because I was like Danny will sort everything out always for everything um so yeah it was weird I think a lot of people were kind of thinking like how is she going to do this I was thinking that too um but yeah just feeling like I don't know I didn't feel like I had it in me and then I think me not being confident made everyone around me like less confident as well and we're all just like oh what are you gonna do but then when you actually have a baby you kind of just have to get your shit together you don't really have a choice yeah so I guess that's what happened I think I think I've got my shit together now (laughs) (laughs) the baby's alive you do, you do yeah, exactly. you, you're winning every day that baby's all right you it's fed it's clothed you're winning and that's it's, it. it's so adorable as well so you know that's a win as well <laughs> yeah he's very cute um and and how was your birth experience um not great I know that like so my plan I know you should well you should have a plan. <laughs> I talk about this all the time the plans plan. that never happen <laughs> but my plan as is most mother's plans was very um very hippy dippy very like hypnobirthing no um what's it called like interventions yeah so I just wanted it to be really chilled ideally I would have liked to have had a water birth and what actually happened was I think I was just really paranoid um for the last month or so before I gave birth and because my bump was really small like my my bump was all baby there was nothing else so it was small but he was big and there was like not much room so I could always feel him wriggling kicking all the time and then in that last month there were so many times where I just didn't feel him for like 12 hours or even when it had been four hours I was panicking but yeah sometimes it would be like hours and hours and hours so I kept going into the hospital to get monitored I think I went in like five times you know they give you that number to call and I was just constantly calling it and going in And because of that, I went from being low risk to being high risk, even though nothing was wrong. Every time I went in, it was fine. But because we'd had those sort of concerns, they moved me to being high risk. So I couldn't have a water birth. That was step one. And then because he was measuring so big, they booked me in to be induced on my due date. So I never wanted to be induced either. I kind of just wanted it to all happen naturally. So yeah, from there, it all just sort of kicked off. Like I was induced. and also I'd tried to induce oh, this is like so embarrassing I tried to induce myself <laughs> um so I did the whole like Ross and Rachel thing where we had sex and what I did was gave myself a UTI without realizing 
so because of that I had a UTI in labor um and that also caused complications for me and for Remy I think that's what caused it anyway um and also it meant that I was like laboring in my back instead of Mm. like you know because UTIs are all like kidney based and hurts your back so everything just hurt like I couldn't lie down during labor I had to like stand up or sit on the edge of the bed um and then I tried what did I try you know the like there's like a pain medication diamorphine I think it's called yeah um and it's meant to help but instead it just because obviously they don't always work 100% so it made me really high like I felt like I was like dizzy and falling asleep but it did nothing for my pain. And I think it's because a lot of the pain was in my back. So it wasn't like how. So that just messed me up even more because I was still in pain, but I like couldn't see. And I kept trying to fall asleep (laughs) and then like the contractions would wake me back up. So it was just a hot mess. Like I couldn't wait to give birth. (laughs) And then at some point, I can't remember when they said that I think my heart rate dropped or my my something dropped and it made Remy's heart rate drop and they were like it's an emergency we have to rush you to theatre which I think I've heard that they actually say this a lot when it's not even that much of an emergency um like it's kind of more like they want to you know because birth is like a well the NHS is like underfunded and basically they want to kind of get you in and out as quickly as possible um so I feel like if I'd had the baby at home I don't think that we would have had this intervention personally I don't think that but I think it was just taking a while and then they um yeah they rushed me off to theatre I remember trying to sign like a waiver when my eyes were closed and I was like I don't know what I'm doing and then they gave me an epidural even though I was like I was sitting on the thing that you meant to lie on in theatre and they're about to give me the epidural and I was like I'm pretty sure I'm sat on the baby's head like I feel like I shouldn't be sat sat down because I think I'm sitting on his head and they're like, no, you're not. You're like, not even that dilated. It's fine. So they gave me the epidural and then I lay down and they checked and I was 10 centimetres. <gasps> and I was just like, I hate you all so much um, <laughs> because I just didn't want an epidural at all. And then they were like, oh, in this case, you don't need a C-section. You can just push. And I was like, no, I can't because you give me an epidural. Like, I don't know what, like, obviously you can, but I didn't know how because I couldn't feel anything. And then I, I think it was Danny that was like, just do it like you're doing a poo and I was like okay and then I, <laughs> um and then I think they used they gave me a uh, episiotomy as well and used forceps and then oh. out he came so it was literally and then out he came you made it sound so easy like <laughs> well it was easy because I had an epi- uh, uh, epidural but yeah it was literally the opposite of what I wanted like every single thing that happened was not what I wanted at all um mm. And I kind of feel like it was unnecessary. Like I've not really spoken about that before because I don't want any like birthing professionals to pull me upon it and be like, well, actually, but personally, I don't think a lot of it was necessary. And I, I I agree. I don't think they listen to you. I don't think they listen to women a lot of the time because they know best. I do think the whole young mum, and as you said, you had all those in all those barriers up against you already in a profession that's highly biased Mm. so I think they just looked at you and went oh she doesn't know what she's talking about but I also think there's a thing with doctors versus midwives and I think doctors are there to mitigate risk and the moment they think there's the tiniest bit bit of risk they're like this is about science we get the baby out Mm. however we get the baby out like they do not care about your body they don't care about your experience I think that's what doctors are And I think in this country, midwives can be like that. But my midwife and the doctor in the hospital definitely had crossed words about what they were and weren't going to do about it. Yeah, because I think, and a doctor said this to me once, my job is to, you know, basically remove any risk that Mm. there is a live baby at the end of the day. And the mom, like a live mother and baby at the end of the day is my only concern. I don't Mm. care, you know, what I have to do to get that you know, I don't care what you want is essentially what they're saying. We have this medical objective. And I think it's that type of person that is a doctor, right? So I think Mm. they see it as best option is the best outcome. Yeah. But I agree. They don't, because of that, they don't listen at all. And I think the mitigating factors of everything, like Jade Mm. said, Mm. you know, they listen to certain people even less. Yeah. I think that's I think if I do have another baby I'm definitely going to hire a doula because after having Remy like I read more about that 
Um, I was briefly thinking about becoming one myself, which I still might, but Remy's just taking up all my time again. Um, <laughs> damn kids. But yeah, he, um, it, no, doulas, like, I feel like they're really good at, like, advocating for you when you're not able to do that yourself because even though I have all this knowledge now I know realistically if I was like eight hours into a labor I'm not gonna be able to do that for myself so I think yeah that's probably what I'd do next time but at the time I just hadn't really I'd not really looked into much about birth really I just wasn't that probably because I didn't have much time (laughs) after yeah (laughs) um but yeah that's something that I definitely would like research more next time Mm. Okay, so for you, what is the best thing about being a mum? Oh, the best thing. Um, I think with Remy, it's like, I just, he's like my little mate. Like he's actually, he's only two, but I feel like we're friends. I hope he feels like we're <laughs> friends. <laughs> and I think it's really cool that like, he's, like I made him I mean you've seen Remy he's like the coolest and it's just Mm. honestly like every day it blows my mind I'm like I literally made you with the help of Danny I guess but (laughs) he's DNA he's DNA (laughs) I did most of it and it's just yeah I think that's having him every day um like hanging out with him like teaching him new things or sometimes like I don't even teach him things he just learns I don't know where he's got it from and like seeing him change and yeah all of that is just really really cool I think um and even recently like he started um regressing a little bit well quite a bit we think he's got autism but it's not something I'm speaking about too much because he's not been diagnosed yet but I'm like 99% sure um but even with that it's like I think I think I'm just really obsessed with him because I like watch him so closely like everything he does And I just find him, like, fascinating, like, everything he does. And that's how we kind of started picking up on, like, the symptoms uh, or, like, characteristics, traits, I don't know what you call them, of autism. Um, Because there were certain things that, like, a lot of people don't realise their children have autism until a lot later on. Like, it's quite rare to see that in toddlers. But I think it's just because we're so close and we spend so much time together and, like, every little thing that changes... I notice and I pick up on it and stuff um Mm. and so like that's been interesting I feel like this is like a new journey we're going on together as well where it's like it's a bit less natural you know like motherhood can feel really natural most of the time but this is more like trying to like live in his world I guess instead yeah Yeah. and figuring out how he sees things and I think yeah weirdly that's like really interesting for me um I guess because it's just like another challenge isn't it motherhood's just constant challenges but you can see them in like a negative way or a positive way and I think seeing it as like an interesting like a a learning curve for me um because at the moment we're not getting external support and it's all kind of on me but I think it's like yeah really interesting to see I think that's really interesting because I feel like I learn so much just from being a mum like just having to navigate stuff that you've never had to navigate before or you know advocate I think you know I really really think that when the moment you get pregnant you have to just become such an advocate Mm. you know not just for your obviously for yourself which we've talked about like in birth but once your kids are involved like you just have to fight for some really things this for things that should be basic and you know, and you have to figure it out, right? Like it's your job to figure out what's going on. And it's that weirdly is those instincts, they just kick in, don't they? And you just start to think, right, I might have been mistreated in such such, and such situation in the past, but I will not have that for this child. And I want Mm. something better for this child. So you, all your barrier, all your protection and barrier stuff just comes up. It's also a huge lesson in patience. (laughs) Let's be (laughs) honest. (laughs) I think during lockdown, I think I've really had to dig deep on my patience. For mm. an, and I think I'm going to be a great patient person <laughs> when we go back to school. How has lockdown with a toddler been? That must be pretty full on. Uh, yeah, it has been. I think it's getting a lot better now, you know, now that um, restrictions have been eased and like parks are open again. Mm. That's quite a big one because he, um, Remy doesn't really like baby groups or he just doesn't like because he's not sociable so he doesn't like other kids he's quite scared of them um so parks were always like 
our thing, you know, because they're outdoors. So even in the play area outside, if there's a child in his way and he's getting scared and he's like screaming, he can just run and go do something else. Whereas in places like soft play or baby groups, it's just a bit more intense. Um, so yeah, we really struggled without parks. We ended up buying a slide for our back garden and he would just go like up and down it all day Um, (laughs) to the point where he had to make a new game where he actually walks up the slide and then goes down the steps steps. (laughs) (laughs) Um, because it just got so boring but yeah we've had to like we've just had to buy loads of things we bought like a paddling pool as well um just loads of like home games because obviously he wasn't getting that anywhere else Mm. um but yeah it was really difficult I actually think lockdown is what like exaggerated a lot of his um traits because mm, yeah. he definitely was already so my mum works with autistic adults um and before lockdown she brought it up to me and was just like I'm I'm seeing these traits in him like this is what I think um sort of do with that what you will and then a few months into lockdown, she saw him again and she was like, yes, we need to get him seen by a paediatrician. Like he's really regressed. And I think um, I think it's probably because of the lack of seeing anyone apart from me and Danny. Um, mm-hmm. And even Danny was working full time. Like he's had a few weeks off recently. But before that, he was working full time. And then it was just me and Remy all day, every day, which I kind of liked. But obviously for Remy, he, that's all he knows. Like his little world is just me and him in the living room or in the garden or our one allowed walk per day as it was <laughs> then. Um, and I think like having to see my mum through a window and not being able to hug or run up to her and um, a lot of that kind of stuff must have just sort of exaggerated the way he was already feeling about other people. So that was what was most difficult for me was seeing that progression and knowing there wasn't anything I could do about it because we're in this situation and I can't you know bend the rules for him um so it was really really good I think it's about a month ago now that play areas or maybe two months that play areas started opening again in parks um and that's just been great like we literally go to the park every single day because he just loves it and there's like four different parks nearby so we like oh amazing rotate yeah (laughs) what mood are we in today Remy let's go oh that's so sweet what is something about motherhood that you never expected I don't know I think something for me is that I felt like there was this thing like this maternal instinct and that you become a mum and suddenly you just get given this this maternal instinct and <laughs> like those like mums from tv and you overnight know how to like bake and do all this stuff. <laughs> and it doesn't that doesn't exist what that didn't happen for you (laughs) no they skipped me um and I think that's something that's again I think that's definitely a representation issue it's like a lack of representation because you only see this perfect you know mum of a certain age uh usually white like middle class and and things like that so I thought I was going to be white and middle class overnight wow (laughs) I'm well still, still to day. <laughs> two and a half years down the road I'm not um but yeah I think just learning that like you don't have to be a certain way and some you know everyone's different so some mums like kind of really take to the role and revolve their whole life around their kids they might have like multiple children and that's like their thing and they really just love that um but then also you can you know enjoy motherhood but still have your job or have like hobbies or a social life probably not all three but you can pick one of them (laughs) I think realizing that and realizing that I can still be me and like make mistakes and have fun and do things but I just have a child as well so like a lot did change I did become more responsible and more mature but equally like I didn't have to like give up my whole life and my whole personality and I feel like there's this picture of motherhood that makes you feel like you do um and especially like when I was pregnant there were people even people close to us like um like my boyfriend's family and stuff who would say things like oh you're never gonna go to a festival again like bet you're gonna miss them or like um you know I won't cap I'm not gonna see you spending your money on this again and it's just like well no I am still gonna do those things because of course I I like them (laughs) it's fun um but yeah I definitely think maybe it is an older generation thing 
and that's who like controls the media I guess but yeah I just felt like a lot more would change than what did the only thing that really changed is as a as a child completely (laughs) I was gonna say as well I think like older generations they were made to feel like they had to sacrifice do you know what I mean They, they were definitely made to feel like so that's it you must stay home. The dinner needs to be on the table every single day. Mm. You, your own desires need to go. And I do feel like more current parents have gone, fuck that, that's dull. They've looked at the older generations who aren't so happy yeah. with those life decisions and says, no, thank you, I don't want to do that. Mm. But I also think it is the increase in age and some people having parents, or some people becoming parents. Because if you've... You know, Yasmin, I was 34 when I had my daughter, but I like had shit my way for a long time then. I'd spent my money. I'd done the things I wanted to do and I hit mm. that and I was not going to stop doing that. I probably don't buy as many heels as I used to. That definitely <laughs> changed. But, um, aside, but, you know, I think people get used to that. And I think that's, you know, that my sister had her do- had her son at, you know, 19. We're like opposite ends of this scale. And there are totally pros and cons. Mm, you yeah, know, definitely. she's 40 and she, he's left. He's running his own business. He's doing stuff. And I'm still, you know, arguing about social media with my daughter, <laughs> you know, at, and, we're, and I'm older than her. So it's really interesting, I think, to think. But I totally agree with Jade. There is a generation that was expected to have their kids by 24 and then give up anything that they ever wanted in life. Mm, yeah. And I think with like you being at uni and stuff like that, that would have, you know, 15 years ago, that would have been the end of uni for you. Like yeah. it, those sorts of things, I think. So we've kind of touched on it a little bit already um, with stereotypes, but we often talk about stereotypes people um, see about themselves in the media that they really hate. Mm-hmm. Um, and just wondering, yeah, what what you see that drives you insane <laughs> um well it depends which like stereotypes of which part of me but I think for young mums there's definitely a lot of stereotypes um and just a, a lot of yeah I think society just has a certain image of young mums being a certain way um usually like financially unstable irresponsible like didn't want their child or don't love their child, like neglectful, mm. um, selfish. Yeah, just all very negative. I don't think I have ever really seen a positive representation of like young mums. So I think that's a really frustrating stereotype because now I've got, I mean, I'm a young mum obviously, but also a lot of my friends are, like I've met other young mums over the past few years and they're all, absolutely incredible like whether they're still with their partner or their single mums quite a few of them are single mums and the strength that they have and the things that they do like you never see that anywhere you you will never see that on like an advert or um as like a character on a soap or whatever like you don't see what is the reality like what I see and I think that's just something that's really frustrating to me because so many of these mums are just incredible and they just don't get the credit they deserve Mm. Um, and then in terms of like brown mums I feel like I I don't even think there's stereotypes I think you need representation to have stereotypes and I don't think there's yes. that at the moment um potentially if there are any I can't think of any like adverts or shows or films really well, they're all just they're all like um the family in EastEnders, the, the Masood, yeah. or yeah. there's, um, you know, Citizen Khan, or yeah. they're all proper stereotypical versions of what a brown yeah, mum is. Yeah. And usually they're angry, they're older, they're shouty. Yeah, they're, they're not like, showed, not. there's no nuance whatsoever in what a brown mum is. No. And I do like from, I've got quite a lot of um, Indian and Pakistani and friends from that region of the world. Mm. But at the same time, their, their mums are like most mums they are the people who run the house let's be honest yeah however they've they're they're kind and they're sensitive and they're mm. loving and they they feed me jesus christ they <laughs> feed me do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah and if you don't take the food they take it as you don't like me like, yeah. <laughs> there's so much different um viewpoints of what a brown mum is and it, it mm. it's quite sad really isn't it that the world yeah. won't let that those nuances be seen yeah yeah I see that a lot in general like because 
growing up the only I mean like you said I think the mis- they are the Masoods aren't they yeah. yeah I think that's like the only sort of consistent brown faces I had on my screen and they were just very stereotypical like even the whole um gay storyline and how they were like we hate gay people um it was just such a bad stereotype though like I know there was a lot I I mean because because it was a soap it's a bit different because you see like every single day you see them but yeah things like that really don't help because not only is it a stereotype but like that's more similar to like maybe what my grandma's generation was like and then like even my mum is nothing like that and and she has her own I mean it's the same as as any type of people like you would never be able to stereotype white mums because you see like 30 or 40 different versions of them and it would be the same with brown people or black people like you can't you can't give one picture of them because every single person is so different and I think that's what's frustrating that you kind of have to just be appreciative of any kind of representation you get even if it's not good or Mm. you know accurate because you're so starved of that and I think that's like a big shame absolutely it's also why I love social media though because well I've never seen someone like me anywhere else other than social media and Mm -hmm. I love that like you're in control of the narrative because you're telling your own story and you're in control of what you're showing and how you're being perceived to a certain extent um so that's why I feel like it's really powerful I mean you still you still don't get that much representation on social media but it's like a lot better for it and it's why I love it big fan yeah all right then so kind of you're kind of dipping into it a little bit, but what, what made you want to start your YouTube channel? Um, so I actually started my channel before I had Remy. Um, I don't know why I originally started it. I think I just thought it would be a cool thing to do, but I didn't know what I was doing. Like every single video was about something completely different. <laughs> um, I was just doing it for the sake of it, really. And then when I found that I was pregnant, I deleted all my videos and sort of restarted. Um because I think I just had a lot of time on my hands like those last few months of pregnancy and then that first year of motherhood I mean you have a lot of time and you also don't but I mean like I had a lot of time at home to myself Mm. like maybe I'd get like half an hour here half an hour there Um, and I just felt like I wanted to do something productive I think because that was the year that I was out of uni as well and Mm. I don't know maybe I felt like I wanted to prove something I just wanted to have something to to show for it I suppose other than the whole human child (laughs) (laughs) Um, so yeah I just started making videos about that they were they were never anything again it was still again kind of for the sake of it and it was only probably when he was around one that I started doing Instagram as well and then the platforms like worked really well alongside each other and I kind of went back a bit to doing what I was doing pre-Remy which was talking about like topics and issues like you know like identity politics like things slightly just bringing in like old Yasmin meets new Yasmin so it'd be about like motherhood but a bit political um so things like being a young mum or lack of like representation within mum bloggers and things like that um so I feel like I finally found my thing um which is good because I think the online mum world is very saturated and it can be hard to Well, not necessarily hard to stand out because a lot of people are just doing the same thing, but it can be hard to sort of figure out what you want to do. Because for me, Mm. at least, I got very influenced by what everyone else was doing. Um, Things like what's in my changing bag and like, (laughs) you know, here's what you need at six months old. But that's not stuff that I it's not stuff that I like to watch. It's not stuff that I like to create. But that was what I saw all the other mums doing. So I felt like that's what you have to do. And I feel like it's good that I've now gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't care what everyone else is doing. This is what I want to do. And yeah, I just really enjoy it. And even though I've stopped doing YouTube recently, that's very much like a case of I've just gotten in my own head because YouTube takes a lot longer than Instagram. Yeah. Um, like, you know, at the beginning, I was like, I prefer Instagram. It's because you can just take the picture, write a caption and upload it. Whereas YouTube just takes so long. Mm. And like the payoff isn't as satisfying as well sometimes because of the algorithm and all this stuff. So yeah, I'm very much like, on an Instagram hype at the moment. (laughs) And 
you talk about um, being vegan on your channel a lot, and I think it's the most relatable vision, I guess, most relatable sort of looking at veganism that isn't like, this is a terrible stereotype, but someone sort of skipping through plants and (laughs) being really happy and holding bunnies. And I mean, (laughs) you're like, okay, we like junk food, so this is what we're going to eat. I mean, you were vegan before you got pregnant, weren't you? Yeah. I'm trying to think. I think I went vegan like a year before, a year before I got pregnant, I think. Um, But I've been vegetarian. So basically I went pescatarian when I was like seven and I can't remember why, but I know it was something I'd seen maybe online or at school, probably something I shouldn't have seen. So maybe it was online and I remember (laughs) just, saying I wanted to be vegetarian because at the time I thought it was vegetarian to eat fish so I was actually pescatarian but I didn't know yeah. and I asked my mum if I could go vegetarian and she was just like okay like there weren't really any questions she was just like sure <laughs> and then she did it with me as well um which was obviously really helpful because she cooked most of the meals so that was just like really supportive like it was only till later on that I realized a lot of parents aren't that supportive of like kids who want to go veggie or vegan um probably just because it adds more to their plate but yeah so I did that for a really long time and then I went through this brief like rebellious fit I don't know who I was rebelling against myself I guess when I was a teenager and I started eating meat again I still to this day don't know why or what I was doing and then I yeah I went vegan when I went to uni and I was trying to go vegetarian again but at uni everyone just a little bit more aren't they like being vegetarian wasn't <laughs> wasn't it's enough. not cool enough no, it's not cool that wasn't enough. The thing anymore it's being vegan and this was oh my god the amount it's changed in like four years is crazy because I remember I used to have to go to the big Morrisons in town to get soy milk like soy milk not even oat milk yeah um and crazy. I'd have to yeah there was only like one type of vegan sausage and it was horrible um but at uni you don't really eat anyway do you so it's kind of fine <laughs> really yeah and then in terms of like making vegan content that just kind of happened accidentally because obviously everyone takes pictures of their food and puts it on Instagram that's like the thing and (laughs) I started doing that and people would always be like oh I love I love like seeing what you eat because I've always been a big foodie so I will literally like revolve a trip around food but if Mm. I know I'm going to London I'm like okay here's all the places I want to go and eat um and then I would like put them on my Instagram and people liked it and I was just like well you're just encouraging me to eat more and more food so I'm gonna keep <laughs> and do it for the fans but yeah it's like I really like that kind of content myself now like I think it's like that sort of like accessible veganism and just it's just a lot more casual like I don't even really do recipes because I just want to sort of show that it's like for some of the food you don't even need a recipe just like throw all this food together and it's fine like (laughs) it's edible and just to show how like easy things are like I did have to give up focusing as much on vegan junk food just because you can't health health (laughs) for health um I'm not a teenager anymore but yeah now it's more about just like stuff you can buy in supermarkets and things that are accidentally vegan I love talking about stuff like that people are just like so shook they're like what skittles are vegan and I love (laughs) I love the excitement they get um but yeah I do think that for a long time veganism was seen as something that was really scary and only one sort of type of person went vegan Mm. um and they were really like angry and again it's a stereotype thing I guess but I think (laughs) build that stereotype and it put me off like for a while um like I was it's, this is embarrassing in itself, but I was kind of that vegan that was like, I'm not like other vegans. <laughs> I'm a cool <laughs> vegan. Um, and whereas now I'm like, okay, everyone's just a bit different. Like, I think it's one of them things that when you're educated on why you should go vegan, it can be really hard to keep that to yourself because you're like, why mm. isn't everyone doing this? But I think it's important to try and rein that in because it isn't the best way to get the message across. Like, I think the best way to get the message across is to be like, how good do these brownies look? By the way, they're vegan. Mm. Well, that's how I do it anyway. <laughs> I love your, like, this is what a lazy vegan eats in a day. I was like, oh, you can be yeah. lazy and vegan? This is now yeah. really starting to sound appealing to me. Because <laughs> it seems to me like a lot of work. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't know. But if you can be lazy and vegan, then I'm much um, more interested. I'm proof. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it if you couldn't be lazy. <laughs> love it tell me if, if it's too much to ask this question I mean I think it's very rude 
Do you mind me asking if um, you would like more children? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I would. I really would. Like, I've wanted more children since I found out I was pregnant. Um, <laughs> not all at once. <laughs> I haven't even got one and a one another one. <laughs> back then, it was because everything wasn't going how I'd wanted it to. Like, when I found out I was six months pregnant, I was like, well, I'm going to have to do this again because I want the whole nine months, mm. which I know is probably, there's probably <laughs> some pregnant women out there that are like, are you joking? This is horrible. But I just wanted to experience it all and know what I was experiencing. And then when I had the rubbish birth, I was like, well, I definitely need to do this again and do it properly next time. Like I constantly, like it was for the wrong reasons originally. It was like I wanted to do over essentially. <laughs> Whereas once Remy was maybe like, 18 months I just wanted I did the typical like I want another baby because they're small and squishy and he's now like running away from me so I definitely want another one I just for a while it was like we wanted a bit more like financial stability before we had another yeah. one whereas now it's more like Remy obviously has like a lot of challenges going on in his tiny little head and I just kind of want to know where we're at with him so I don't know what that means or what that will look like, but I think probably if he gets diagnosed, which I'm hoping he does sort of in the next six months or so, um, and then if we have like a support plan in place and we know what we're doing and we've got like, I don't know, maybe certain therapies that we go to on certain days, you know, like we're just a bit more, we've got him in a routine. Yeah, I think then I'd probably feel comfortable having another baby, but at the moment, he just needs so much of my attention and I would worry that he wouldn't get that if I had a newborn. Yeah. Um, Completely. Yeah. Well, most people at 21, they have, they get addicted to tattoos. You got addicted to children. <laughs> so that's... I did get addicted to tattoos and then I had a child <laughs> and I can't afford any more. Exactly. Yeah. So it's very frustrating actually. <laughs> Um, finally, tell us and all the other mums where they can follow you and this wonderful child that you have. Um, so maybe don't go to my YouTube because that will give you <laughs> do videos and I, I don't do that right now. Um, but I'm on Instagram at Yasmin Johal X and I post really nice vegan food and I have a really cute child. And that's why. <laughs> what more could you want, guys? <laughs> exactly. And that was the amazing Yasmin. Don't forget that you can follow her on socials, Yasmin Johal X on Instagram. You can join the Good Enough Mums Club by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching Good Enough Mums Club. We'd love it if you can hit that subscribe bottom. Bottom? <laughs> That's a whole different. It's a whole different game. You can join the Good Enough Mums Club by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching Good Enough Mums Club. We'd love it if you can hit that subscribe button for the podcast, rate and review wherever you listen. And if you know a mum who'd like this, please tell them about it. If the stories in this podcast resonated with you or made you think or even just reassured you that you're doing okay as a mum, you'll love the episodes that we have coming up. Next week, we have a super important and emotional episode with Katie who was chatting about her experience of baby loss after her daughter Ottilie was stillborn last year. It's such an important story and one we're sure lots of women will benefit from hearing. Thanks so much for listening. Bye. 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 How will I ever be good enough? When will the loneliness fade away? Why does it have to be so tough? Hard as I try, I'll never be good enough.